And amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good evening. Good evening. It's great seeing everybody this evening. We're going to go ahead and we're going to open up in prayer. If everybody can go with me in prayer for God, get our hearts and our minds clear and ready. Father God, as always, we are thanking you for this day that you have made. We are rejoicing and we are exceedingly glad in it, Father God. Thank you for continually using us to go out and spread your good news, Father God. Spreading your word, Father God. Doing it cheerfully, Father God, and abundantly, Father God. And it is never a burden. And we're just thanking you for always keeping your hedge of protection around us, Father God. Keeping us covered, Father God. And just always loving us and giving us your peace, your grace, and your mercy. Freely, every day, Father. We thank you for the traveling grace for those that are on their way out, Father God. Bless those that were not able to make it out, Father God. We just love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. amen, amen. Now, I do not have this month, but I am filling in for Elder Carter. You will be seeing him the Wednesday, Wednesdays after this one. Amen. And so, uh, amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So I am feeling there for my brother. Our lady, why he is gone, and the family are gone. We're keeping them in prayer. Amen. Father God, and we're just we're going to go for it. Grab your word and go to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. I'm going to read, I'm going to start at verse 4. King James Version. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4, and I'm going to read through 9. Again, that's Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4, and I'm going to read down to 9. Say amen when you get there. Hold up. Amen. Ephesians, oh, King James Version. Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4. Any more hold ups? Amen. And it reads this. But God, who is rich in mercy, or his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now the target scripture is verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The study for this month which is for Elder Carter, it is continue in God's grace. Yes. Continue in God's grace. And now the target trip out of the sand was eight. Now, in order to continue in God's grace, they first have to know what it is. It's often associated with mercy. God's grace is given freely. It rains on the just as well as the unjust. The just are the ones, like us, that give God the credit for what he does, and the unjust don't. Us who are just are plugged into the power source, which is God. And so we know that we can ask what we will, and we shall have it, because grace made it, and our faith takes it. Now, I'm going to read you two definitions of grace. I'm read you the Bible definition, and then I'm going to read the online definition of grace. First one, favor or kindness shown without regard to the worth or merit of the one who receives it, and in spite of what that same person deserves grace is one of the key attributes 
of God. Online definition. Unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or sanctification. A virtue coming from God. A state of sanctification enjoyed through divine assistance. Now, we, when you get into a Bible believing, Bible teaching atmosphere, then that's when you can truly get an understanding of what grace really means. Because a lot of people will tell you about God's grace but teach you law. And grace and law are not the same. Because the law, which wasn't even for any of us, which are Gentiles, came to increase sin and enhance sin and to show you, show the people that they needed a Savior. They asked for the law. You know what I'm saying? And so, yep, and that was wrath. And back then, but you got to realize that there was grace in the beginning, and it started with Adam and Eve. And God's people traded it for the law. As I was saying, they traded God's grace for the law. They asked for the law. With the law, in order to receive from God, you had to do something first. But Jesus fulfilled the law. Then grace came back on the scene after Jesus. And grace is everything that you need and want from God, and He is, and it has already been provided for you. That's the one thing that you got to realize about grace is that it is a gift, and it's a gift that is given from God. And when we we've talked about it several times in here, and what a lot of people, a lot of religious folks get the uh, definition of a gift confused. Because a gift is given. You don't have to do any work for the gift. You don't know that you're receiving the gift. The gift is given. So, therefore, you didn't have to do anything to earn it. You didn't have to put in no work. You didn't have to do this or do that in order to receive it. It was given. And the law swerved that, and religious folks swerved down that they're giving you grace, but they're always telling you and spreading hate and condemnation and putting rules and regulations that you have to do this first, you have to stop this, you can't do this, you can't, you can't, you can't. When we know that all that was in the law and had nothing to do with grace, they're living by the Old Testament, which was not given to them. And forgetting everything that Jesus did. And they're they're saying that what he did wasn't enough. And that it and that there's still more work to do. Just like they always try to say that you have to do something in order to be righteous. You have to do something other than what it says in Romans ten and nine. That's believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. That Jesus is Lord and that he died on third that he died and rose on the third day for you. We, I love it because we, we give you the opportunity to do that at the end of every Sunday service to where we do the prayer of salvation. And that is all that is required for you to be saved. That is all that is required for you to get into place and start learning about the grace that is provided for you. Because if you don't know what grace truly is, you can't continue in it. If you are thinking that the law and hate and condemnation is grace, then you're sadly mistaken. If you were thinking that telling the people that they're going to hell for doing this and doing that is grace, that's not what that is going to do. That is pushing people further and further away from God. And the one thing that a lot of religious folks that are spreading the law will not do and let you know is that the law was perfect. Why was it perfect? Because it was given from God. It was perfect for the purpose that it was for. But what happens is, is religious folks try to add to that law. And that's what makes it strange and deranged and makes it worse than what it was meant to be. Because as we said, the law came to increase sin. But religious folks like to put their opinions and their feelings and their additives in on it 
and add to it. It was already 613 of them, but they only talk about the 10. Because a lot of them don't even know that it was 613. Go ahead, sir. As I was saying, Numerous is with the law. Uh, the law of Moses, when we look at it, it was, when God gave it, it was perfect. And that's the thing about it. It was so perfect um, because God wanted them to see that you can't even do these 10 without me. And sure enough, nobody was able to do anything without him. And he was trying to show them that you guys are the same. You guys can't do it. I, here's, here's 10 old stones. We ain't even talk about the other 603. Who needed the 10 old stone? They couldn't even keep the 10 old stone. And that was the moral law. And so, I mean, as soon as Moses got them, the 10 commandments, which was the moral law, he came down to the bottom of the mountain, right? And what was happening? Orgies and everything else right there in front of Bob. So what did he do? He broke them. He came back and broke them. You know why? Because the people that already broke them, even before he even got them to them. And so that's the whole thing. The law was made perfect, and it was made perfect to show you that you can't do it on your own. You need to say Amen? Amen. You know, that was really good when Pastor went, because oftentimes people think that you got to be perfect to come to God. But you come to God, and it's through Christ Jesus that he sees the perfection in us. We're not perfect. It's Jesus that is. Because he's the one that fulfilled the law. Because man could not do it. Yes, we're made in his likeness and his image, but we're not him. We still know, we have to know that we have a creator. We have a savior. You know what I mean? And I'm so glad that even through man failing, he loved us enough to give us grace again. To give us his son so that he can fulfill the law that man cannot fill. Because the law is not only increasing sin, but the wages of sin is what? Death. So it brought upon death upon us. And that's not what he meant for us. He meant for us to have a life, a everlasting life. And except in Jesus, then and only then are we made perfect through Christ Jesus to fulfill what God wants us to have. Amen. Another thing you said about how folks you know, get saved, how folks trying to teach you to be strange, you know. And I experienced this the other day in the gym. I was talking to this person, and she said she was a Christian. And so as I was speaking to her, some dude came up to her, and he said hello to me, and I gave him a fist bump. And then he tried to give her a fist bump, and then, then you know, he, he touched her because uh, he was trying to give her a fist bump. She, she made, I mean, she got stiff, turned around, looked, I mean, her eyes were big, like somebody had did something to her, you know? And I'm looking at this, and she's acting strange like this, and this guy's running off at this point, right? Because he's like, you know, I don't know, did I do something wrong? I don't know what I did, so he's running off. And she thinks that this is how Christians are supposed to act. And then she goes into her self-righteous, her self-righteousness by saying, oh, those guys, him and his friend, they hang out at bars, and they go to places like that. I don't go to bars. I don't hang out in places like that. I don't drink. I don't do this. I don't do I said, boy, this sure sound like that old Pharisee in Luke 18. Luke 18, I think it's verse 11. It's not like that, but it's... I, I, <laughs> I'm not like that guy right there, that pumpkin, that sitter. I, I, say I, I, I fast twice a week. I pray. I tithe on everything I get. I am thank, I thank you, God, that I'm not like that guy. He's a sinner. And, and at this moment, we were just talking about John, the book of John. And the thing about the book of John, the whole book is about John always writes in it. He writes himself in as a third, the third person, right? He always says, the one who Jesus loved. He's talking about himself. Every time, he's always talking about himself. And, and so we just got finished talking about how God was loved, and then she turns around and does this strange thing, like she hates this guy, and 
force them away from us instead of bringing them into the conversation and letting them hear about Jesus. Amen. But no, she didn't do that because she was trying to be religious and religious people act strange. We're in a joke. Why are you acting like this? And so she forced him, the very people that Jesus came to save are the very people that religion runs off. Amen. Amen? Amen. And so this is why we have to, you know, you can't just give your life to Jesus one day and say, I'm saved and that's it. You have to, the Bible says you have to be transformed through the renewing of your mind. And if you don't get transformed through the renewing of your mind, religion is going to automatically take over because you're going to be taught the commandments. When I say the commandments, you're going to be taught the Mosaic law instead of being taught the law of Christ. Which is love. Amen. And I like how you said they were uh, transformed through the renewing of your mind. The one thing that we always have to be mindful of and realize is that when he's talking about the renewing of your mind, he's meaning with this word. Mm-hmm. Not with religion, but with the actual word. Not with people's opinions, not people's feelings, but the actual word. And a lot of times, how you can tell when someone is not giving you the word is they'll tell you, well, I feel, or I believe, or I think. That's when they're giving you their opinion, they're not giving you the word. Because when you have an actual relationship with the Father, and you are doing, like it says, study to show thyself approved, the word may not be ashamed, rightly, rightly dividing the word of truth, then you can confidently speak the word. Why? Because you know it. You have it stored in you, so you can confidently speak it and say, well, God says, Jesus said, the word says, not pastor said, not bishop said, not deacon said, not minister said, not uh, my, my grandmama and them said, but you will say, this is what the word says. This is what Jesus said. Let me explain to you what grace really is. Grace is not telling you that, that you're going to hell if. Grace is not telling you that you must change this if. Grace is not telling you that the only way that God will hear from you and heal your land is if you repent from your sins. <laughs> That, that's not, that doesn't fall under grace. So what covenant are you speaking? What covenant are you trying to put people under? See, that's the thing. If you aren't in school here in place, then you won't understand what covenant you're under. And you allow people to keep instilling you with law and with their opinions and their feelings and not giving you the truth. There's only one way to repent from sin, and that's accepting Jesus Christ. So Lord, Other than that, there's no way to repent from sin. You just can't do it. Because until you bring Jesus into your life, you were known as a sinner, not because of your works, but because of Adam and Eve's works. And so people don't get it. You know, and even, you know what gets me, even when we are in here and we get, get messages, I can remember Sunday I gave the, the one Sunday, was it Sunday? I gave a message, and I gave, I'm telling you, I gave so many scriptures, and I was going quick because I don't go back. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. All these scriptures were saying, how God has forgiven our sins and sins and no longer being charged for our account and everything. And, you know, we talk about how Jesus is made wine and all this type of stuff. And at the end of the service, somebody comes up to me and says, do you think that it's right to tell people that they can drink? I'm like, where on the planet were you? Where? It's okay to drink. And then they, then they were like, oh, well, strong drink. They can't drink strong drink. Like, where is this person? Anyway, it, I'm like, Lord, this person is a foreigner. And I understand what Paul is going through because that's what, that's what the minister of Satan, all right, always, the minister of Satan is always going to be there to prevent you from receiving God's grace. It's all the Antichrist, the, the Bible says the spirit of Antichrist is working today. You know, people are waiting on oh, when the Antichrist will come missing. Why will all be telling us that the spirit of Antichrist is working today? And so now when you give somebody grace and they give you back the law, you have to understand that they are being they are being led astray by Satan by Satan himself. They think the devil is not in the church, and that's what he said this room no that in the church. When he was cast down, he wasn't cast into hell, he was cast onto the earth. And in the scriptures, you know, it tells us, dealing with the seven churches, it tells us about the church of Pergamos and how Satan had killed the man of God who was over, uh, who was on the throne there. 
And if anybody knows, that was the Roman church. And today we still have that church. And they're doing, you know, a lot of things behind the scenes. And it's, it's because it's all about their traditions. It's all about their rituals. It's not about Jesus. And anything that is about anything other than Jesus is a cult. Amen. The main thing that a lot of people need to realize, what I can't say enough is, is that God's grace is a gift. It is a gift. And God's grace is everything that you need plus want from Him. And the, and the best part about it is, is that since God knows our beginning and our end, and since He started the new covenant and the new contract, everything that you need to want has already been provided for you. It's already been made for you in your spiritual. But the part that we don't that, that doesn't get talked is that when you speak it using your faith, then you activate it for it to manifest into your physical. Amen. But as we always talk about it here, out of the fivefold ministry, the teacher part is always neglected to where you aren't being taught. Because I love how Pastor has taught us many times in teaching the pain. You gotta believe it, see it. And receive it. And I remember I, I heard him say that, and, and I took him up on. I was like, you know what? I was like, I, I, I want to see him. if I can see me with it before. And the thing I love about our God is that He is uh, revealing God. Yeah. Revelation knowledge is always better than any kind of educational knowledge, and He always reveals things to us. And I remember one time I was at a, at a dealership. And uh, Pastor, I gave a message speaking on that, about uh, seeing yourself with it and stuff. And I was sitting there, and I was just, uh, and I was waiting for him. They was doing all their little information or whatever and stuff. And so, and all of a sudden, I was just sitting there, and I just, I guess, daydream. I started daydreaming or whatever, and I seen myself driving off mm -hmm. with the exact vehicle that I was there for. And I was like, man. And I wasn't even thinking about it until I left driving in it. But at that time when I when I see myself, what I wasn't even thinking about the message that was given until I was leaving, and I was like, you know what? This is exactly what I what I seen me doing before it actually happened. Because God gave me that revelation. I seen myself in my spiritual already with it. And so I was able to speak it. And one of the one thing that never ever happened to me before, that was the first time it ever happened, and it, it's happened twice. To where the people from the bank wanted to talk to me. They was like, hey, uh, people in the bank, they want to talk to you. I'm like, want to talk to me? <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, Mr. Rock, uh, we just got a couple questions. The vehicle's yours, but we just got a couple questions. I was like, oh, okay. What's the questions? <laughs> and he asked me a couple quick questions. I was like, okay. He's like, all right, all right um, the paperwork is already being done. Go ahead. And, and that was from that time is where I started putting it into practice that it, that you don't live by your credit score and you don't live by the things that the world tells you. You live by what God tells you. Yeah. Yeah. You speak those things that be not as though they were. Meaning speak what you want to see. Speak your victory. Speak your outcome. Don't go off of what people say and what it may look like. Go ahead, sir. You know, uh, we have been you know, the Bible, when it says that we were born in sin, shape, in the iniquity, talking about their, their wickedness, we don't even realize how much we actually take in daily. And, you know, we, we limit ourselves because the world says limit yourself. How does the world say limit yourself? What a credit score. And they'll tell you that this is, if you don't have this type of credit score, then you can't do that. You haven't even attempted or even tried to get something yet. But you look at your credit score and you immediately limit it, not just yourself, but you limited God in your life because you are living by the world system. We as the children of God, we don't accept that mess. I know we walk up to a place and we're like, hey, can we get this? And if they say, no, I'm like, look, somebody want my money. I'm going to just go to the next place. 
Because somebody always wants your money. So you don't get what you want if you just don't, if you don't limit yourself of world standards. That's why it says don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed the renewal of your mind. Because we conform ourselves to this world, we continuously put ourselves under limitations. I mean, this whole system is a mess. Let's think about how it works. So, if you don't pay your bills on time, what happens to your credit score? It drops, right? Your credit score drops, drops, drops. You don't pay your bills. If you get some repo, your credit score drops. If you don't pay something uh, off and they take it, your credit score drops, right? But check this out. If you pay all your bills, cash, cash out, and you just purchase everything, right? And you don't have absolutely no debt in your life. That's what your credit score is. Horrible. Zero. Torn up. And here it is. Yes, it's worse than the person that, that couldn't afford it, bought it, and then lost it. This system is so messed up. And the thing about it is, we, as the children of God, have grabbed hold of the world system. And we run around talking about, well, my credit score won't let me get. What do you mean your credit score won't let you get? Credit, nobody's credit score ever gave me anything. Everything, promotions, gifts, blessings, promises, all came from God. Amen. Amen. And I'm glad you said that because everything that you just said is part of his grace. Amen. Yes, it is. It is part of his grace. As I said, everything that you need and want falls under the grace. It falls under the grace. And it's a gift. Just like how the uh, I didn't do anything by the world standards. Because by the world standards, I shouldn't have got the vehicle. But guess what? God's grace. God's grace is why I was able to get it. It wasn't going off of me. My credit score wasn't going off of putting down this or doing that. It wasn't going off the system that the world puts out that you have to do this, 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 and this in order to get this, 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 and this. The same way when it comes to jobs. When they had to listen, oh, you must have this degree, or oh, you must have this and this in order to get that. And a lot of us in here have given the testimonies of where we have continually worked jobs without having the degree of this, or having the degree of that, or what they say, what the world says that you're supposed to have. And have been promoted. You're working above the ones that have that degree. And the ones that had a degree are answering to you. And it goes back to what you said. All promotions come from God. Yeah. It all falls under His grace. But if you aren't in school to learn about God's grace and how it is a gift, and I like how it says unmerited favor, meaning that you didn't have to do something strange for a piece of change. You didn't have to do nothing strange in order to change. Because religion will tell you that you have to do something strange in order to change. And that you have to beat each other up and talk down to each other to make a change. So when you do not, all you have to do is to allow the Holy Ghost, who is a perfect gentleman, to continually work in you. And what will happen is the things that are unpleasing to God, you will start to lose the desire to do those things. And you won't constantly beat yourself up. And that's why a lot of times I, I get that from the other car. I will tell God, you know what, God, save me from me. So that I don't speak what you have for me. I don't speak against what you have for me. I don't prolong what I'm asking you for. By sitting up here being all being all zealous and oh yeah, when I'm in here with my brother and sister Christ being built up and stuff, like, oh yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready. And then once I get by myself, then I just shrivel up and just allow the enemy to have his way with me. And to allow every situation to get me to fold and crumble like an envelope and like a transformer. Instead of realizing that you know what? I have the power. It doesn't matter if I'm with my brother or sister. I still have the power. Why? Because I got Jesus. Amen. And that is the power I don't need. I don't need power from man. I need power from my Father, which he gave to all of us freely. Jesus gave us the keys. He gave us all power. 
to where we can speak those things and be not as other worthy. We have free will. That is ultimate power. Meaning, guess what? We can choose to love God. We can choose to go against what God says, or we can choose to not. That's power. Meaning that we can cut ourselves off from the Father. And it says in the word, nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing can separate us from love. But what we'll do is we'll put the scales up and think that he doesn't love us. And think that he has turned his back on us. Thinking that we're unworthy. And thinking that we don't have any more power because we did this. We did that. When that's because you haven't went back to the hospital. You haven't pulled up to the fuel station to be fueled up. That's why I'm always in a hurry to be back in the place so I can get refueled. Amen. Amen. Just like when your vehicle is running low on gas, you go to the, to a gas station so you can refuel. Mm -hmm. Just like when your, your faith man, your spirit man, may be getting a little low because you've allowed yourself to be consumed with the things that are going on around you in the situations and the problems and you might have started speaking other than what you're supposed to because you may have allowed the flesh which happens to everybody none of us are perfect so we always fall short of the glory we always get in a situation where we may get consumed but that's where we have to realize that hey we have a brother or sister in Christ that we can reach out to to where iron sharpens iron to where that, guess what, you don't have to do this on your own. But the one thing that we always have to do is I love our disclaimer in here is that, hey, we will help you get on your feet, but we will not become your feet. Meaning, hey, we will help to show you, hey, this is the real relationship. This is the road you need to be on. This is what grace is really about. Hey, guess what, your faith is what takes what grace has already made. And God will give you peace to keep it. Don't blame God when you have stepped out and around and not used your faith and used your own self and went and got something and then all of a sudden it's, it's being taken away from you. That don't don't say that quote that uh that the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. That is not true. That that is a lie. And I didn't I didn't understand that and know that because I used to say stuff like that. But that was before I knew the truth. But I always knew that something in me was like, you know what, something just ain't right with some of the stuff that you say. But when you don't know about discernment, when you haven't tasted and seen how good God is, then you don't know. People can tell you, hey, this pot of meat is safe. And you're like, oh, okay, this is good, this is good. But then when you actually get some safe, when you actually get the truth, you like, hold up, hold up. Oh, my God, nah, 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 nah. You fooled me, wait, no. This is a steak. That over there is some pot of meat out of the can. That ain't steak. Hey, hold on, wait, wait, wait. God is love. That is not love that you were talking about. You're going to hell if. You must stop if. You can't, you can't, you can't. Ah, nah, 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 hold on. You must first do something in order for God to do Whenever you hear all that, that, that if, you know that's not God's word. But you have to be in a place where you're getting taught the truth. Because God's grace is his love, his peace, his joy, his mercy, whatever you can possibly need from him. All the characteristics that it talks about in Galatians 5 and 20. It was 22, 22, 5 and 22. Those are the characteristics of Jesus. That is what we are to mold our lives after. Not what the world tells you that you are to mold your life after. And, it, and the Bible also tells you that the most powerful one, and the best one out of all of them is love. Love. And, and it tells you in the Bible that God is love. It doesn't say God is hate. It doesn't say God is judgment. It doesn't say God is condemnation. No. Oh. But... That's where the enemy comes in to try to use those scare tactics to scare you back home. But all that does is it scares you back to the streets. It pushes you back to the streets. And the thing is, you don't even realize 
that it's the Holy Spirit in you telling you, hey, something ain't right. That, 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 that ain't right about what they're saying. You know something isn't right, but you don't know the truth yet to understand that it's not lining up with God's word. But, yep, and that was me. I just knew something wasn't right. But I, I wasn't taught the truth, so I couldn't pinpoint, well, oh, no, no, you're not giving me God's love. You're just giving me hate and fear. And in the word, it tells you I'm not giving you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Nobody had told me that scripture. But the, the, the scripture that everybody would tell me is the ones that the religious folks would use to uh, try and flip it and try to make it fit their narrative. To try to control you and make you be like them and to fall into their clique. And that is what makes people not want to go to church. And that's what a lot of people say. Oh, well, they're hypocrites. They're hip yes, they are. The ones that are studying religious law and the most they are hypocrites. Because they're telling you, you can't, you can't, you can't, you must, you must, you must. But they're steadily doing everything they tell you that you can't do. They're telling, they're putting all this rules and regulations on you that you got to pray all day, every day. You got to be speaking in the Elizabethan. You got to speak in tongues in order to be saved. You have to do these strange things in order for to God to love you. And that's why. And that's the whole thing of it all because we know the scripture says that God is not there to eat your life. But we know that God never lies. And people are trying to live by the law because they're being taught the law. But the thing about it is the Bible says that the law came to increase sin. So all these people that say because they follow the law, they're not sinners. I mean, plain and simple. God already said if you follow the, the law came to increase sin. So if the scripture tells you the law came to increase sin and you're living, you're trying to live by it, automatically you are in sin. Automatically you're in sin. You go, and that's the thing about it. If you get to a place and you see somebody up in the pulpit and they're always preaching on one sin all the time, I promise you that preacher is doing it. He's doing it. He's trying to keep the attention off of him or her and pushing that out back in the congregation. Well, you know, y'all doing this and y'all doing that, y'all. See, y'all ain't doing nothing. It's really me doing it, and I don't want y'all looking at my looking at my life. So I'm gonna have you all looking at each other. And it's been like that for so long, and nobody has ever stood up to these bullies. And now the time is right. You know, Jesus said that this time is going to see it. Let's do it. Amen. He said the time is now. Amen. Hey man, and when you was talking, it made me uh, think of, go to Acts 20, verse 28, New Living Translation. Acts 20, starting at verse 28, New Living Translation. Again, that's Acts 20, verse 28. I will read down to 32. Acts 20, 28 to 32. If I say, maybe we get there, hold up. Uh, New Living Translation. NLT. Acts 20, 28 to 32. shepherd God's flock, his church purchased with his blood, over whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. I know full well that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some of you will distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you, night and day, and many, years, and many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the word of his grace. His message that is able to build you up 
and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. Now, I like it where it's talking about even some of you will distort the truth in order to draw a following. What does that remind you of? That reminds you of a lot of these uh, pastors today. These religious leaders of how they will preach to the itching ears. They will preach to the people and say what the people want them to say. Versus what God wants them to hear. And and the one thing I, I love about this ministry and that I, I love that our shepherd has allowed himself to be available to God to stand against the grain and not go with the masses and follow what his other pastor friends were going with and, and prepared him for such a time as this and to prepare him for people that would come in here and try to do those very things. But we have had several people come in here claiming all these different titles and everything, claiming this and this, some that didn't even have titles, but still felt that they need to tell pastor how to run his church and what he should be teaching to people, what he should be putting out to the people. Hey, won't you preach on this? Hey, won't you preach on that? Versus, hey, allow God to use you. Give what God says. Because guess what? God meets you where you are, and God gives a word that will reach everybody. And not just the few. You won't be a Jonah to where you're just trying to get a few saved and not doing what God told you to do when he told you to get a whole nation saved. To where we aren't going with the flow. To where we are allowing ourselves to stand up and stand out. And to be bold for God's word. And to spread the truth. Spread the good news. Telling people that you're going to hell and that you're a sinner. That's not good news. Telling you you have to stop. You have to stop. But like I told you before I got here and before I decided to get myself back right, I was like, you know what? My, my whole image of being a Christian was tainted. And so like I said, I thought in order for you to be saved, that meant that your life was over. You was about to be in a retirement home. You were pushing 90. And that's when you could become saved. And you had to be ready to give up everything. Give up all your worldly possessions. Give up everything. And all you do is just sit around singing Amazing Grace and praying all day and wearing three-piece suits and walking around with you holding your Bible all the time in the heat. I thought that's, that was what it meant to be a Christian. That's what you saw. Yep. That was what was presented to me. And teaching was not going forward. Only thing that was going forward was preaching. You can't continue to preach and not teach. Especially if you're preaching above people's heads and not meeting everybody where they are. Because then you have people confused about the word. And guess what God is not? He is not the author of confusion. He makes everything simple and plain. And he said, in all of your getting, get an understanding. So if you can't understand the word, then you're not getting the word. How can you apply the word if you don't understand the word? You know, we give me a song, people will say, well, you know, I wanted to, to speak with the pastor, but um, I was told that you know, should to speak with the pastor, you shouldn't ask the pastor. Questions like that by one of the deacons. And, you know, when people tell you stuff like that, you have to think, uh, where do they get it from? For the simple fact, if I can go boldly to the throne of grace, if I can go straight to God, why can't I go to this guy? You know, I don't understand. Something seems to be wrong with this. You know, like, yeah, okay, I know some people got bodyguards and all that, but you know what? It's ridiculous not to be able to talk to God's people. Because you think you've gotten so big or so so high and mighty that you got to have uh, this group around you and, and no one's allowed to ask you any questions. And that's the problem. That's why we have so much ignorance in the body of Christ because nobody asks questions. And they're afraid to ask questions because they don't want to look a certain way or they don't want to get uh, disciplined, per se, 
by one of the deacons or somebody said you shouldn't be asking the pastor questions like that. Go home and read your Bible. It's in there. That's just mess. That's complete mess and confusion. And, that, and God is not the author of that. If God would talk with us, why can't a man talk with us? And you notice all those exact same people that you were talking about that have the little entourage? You never see not one person in that entourage standing in place where the pastor stands. Now, one time will you see those yes men that are around him, the ones that are going and spreading all the bad news to everybody. You can't talk to him. You can't touch him. Hey, he said this and he said that, giving you all the bad news. You never see them here, standing in front of the people. Only that pastor is here. And the only way you're going to be in his place is if he passes on. And then what's going to happen is, is all the people are going to be fighting to see who's going to be the next one in line. Because then they want to be put on the pedestal that that pastor was put on. They want to be in charge of all the people and commanding all the people and putting all the people under their thumb. They want the juice. They want the power. And not realizing none of that is any heavenly power. None of that is doing anything to getting you to being with the Father. None of that is showing you how to live here and how to live life abundantly here, all the teaching you is, oh, what a time, what a time when I get to heaven. And not even realizing that if they didn't even teach them how to be saved or to even get them saved, then they're not, they're not even going to have a time in heaven. There is not going to be a what a time, what a time in heaven because you're not going to be there. You're not going to be in the numbers. Your name isn't in the Lamb's Book of Life. Why? Because you was never given the truth. On how to sign that blood contract, as I call it. Signing that blood contract is Romans 10 and 9. It's that easy. It is that easy. All you got to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, that he died and rose on the third day for you. It's that easy. But religion makes it strange that you have to do all these things. You have to get rid of these things. You have to become perfect before. Before. You come to the Father. You have to be perfect. You have to already have that certain car and already have to have that certain suit before you can make it in. You got to make it into the click, into the cult. Right. Amen. Um, and as we can continue in God's grace, um, religion also makes it really difficult for believers. I don't want to say young believers, but just believers, in that once you're saved, you can just never mess up ever again. Right? Yeah. Um, my aunt had called me a few days ago, probably a week or so ago. And when I was home, we had a situation where, you know, for some time now, there's been this whole thing, and we don't family, right? And um, one of my uncles has dementia in the early stages of Alzheimer's. And so in that situation, he called out my uncle, who is a pastor. And, you know, for me, I'm like, yo, he's human, made a mistake, move on. Like, God forgave him, who are we? Yeah, move on. And um, I treated him, like, you know, that's my uncle. I, I don't know, I think I'm still 10 when I go for him. Like, I don't care, right? And um, so my aunt calls me. Initially, the conversation was, how are you? How have you been since the accident? And, of course, it moved into that situation. I was like, you know, personally, I care not to talk about it because I'm not to me. They don't get my life, they don't pay none of my bills, not here. And she was like, well, you know, but he, he a pastor, and you know, you just can't be acting like that. I said, well, okay, that's between him and God, <laughs> and it ain't got to do with me. Like, God forgave him, who are we? Like, I said, all I know is y'all need to be mindful of how y'all share information with a Rodney, because he has Alzheimer's. And he just don't forget some things, and so you got to be really mindful of how you share with him because he can't just go out and put and, you know, act a certain way, right? So she can't get really upset because for her, she's like, oh, he's a passion, he's a passion. I'm like, so? I was like, and as we were talking, I said, you know, this really reminds me of that woman at the will, right? And how all of them people wanted to hold her accountable for something, but if... Who, who was it that was to hold her accountable? 
I'm sorry, not going back to Will, but I'm talking about the woman in the, the act of adultery, but like, how could they hold her accountable unless they were with her? But at the same time, Jesus was like, he didn't see her for that. Like, he, he still used her. Like, irregardless, he didn't look at her and say, oh, you're an adulterer, like, blah, blah, blah. That's not even how he came up on her. So, while I understand why y'all keep trying to throw this stuff, I said, no. I said, if I remember correctly, why did they tell me that in 2016? We're in 2024. Why y'all still hold on to it? They don't hold on. Move on. She hung up on me. And I was like, I just texted her. I was like, I love you. You're beyond words. And when I hung up, I was like, they are really. I remember it was like many people in my family that kept trying to tell me about it. And I was confused for a while because I was like, is this something like still happening? Like, I thought it was something still going on. But that is how religion will do you. You mess up one time, and they still hold on to it because of a position, because of a title. And they think, like, because you hold a certain title, you can't ever mess up. But that's not even so. Because in the Word, it said that God forgives you today and forevermore. But religion holds on to things. And it, it goes back to the lie that has been spread and told that all those things are behavior driven. That it is based off, you are saved based off your behavior. You are, you have grace based off your behavior. You have righteousness based off your behavior. You have salvation based off your behavior. Every, everything, yeah, your holiness, everything is based off of your behavior when it's no longer a gift. Because it's based off of your behavior. To where grace is not based off of your behavior. Your salvation is not based off of your behavior. You being forgiven is not based off of your behavior. When Jesus said it was finished, that means he did all the work. He put in all the work. He supplied everything. He took on death. He did everything that was required in order for us to make it back to the Father. Amen. Amen. Everything that was required. So meaning, guess what? If he did it all, what is there left to do? Believe. Nothing. Believe. Yeah, no, no, no other work besides believing believe. what he did, that it was a finished work. And the scripture says that. But other than that, you, your behavior doesn't make you more righteous. Your behavior doesn't make you more holy. Your behavior doesn't make you more saved. Because you did a sinful act, as people would say, that doesn't mean that you're no longer saved. It doesn't mean that you have fallen from grace. To where we we all we already know. I, I love that we have busted that myth several times in here of telling you what it really means to fall from grace. And what it really means to fall from grace is that hey, you know about grace, you've been taught about grace, and you also know about the law. But instead of you staying with the covenant that God has provided for us now, which is grace, you choose to go back to the law. They say that what Jesus did wasn't good enough. That we have to do these 613. Oh, no, they don't want to do the 613. I'm sorry. You have to do these 10. These 10 laws. Where the Bible says if you broke them one, you broke them all. So if you broke one, you broke all 613. Not just 10. But guess what? The law was never for us anyway. And the word even said that, guess what? In order for you to not sin, in order for you to not break the law, guess what? There is no longer no more law for you to break. And the, and the enemy wants to keep you sin conscious. Keep you thinking about sin. Go ahead. I want, I want everybody to sorry for John 6. John 6 and 29. I'm going to start at 26. Is that okay? John 6. Let's start at verse 26. Because, you know, as you were saying, this is how the Bible is portrayed. Um, they portrayed God this way. They portrayed it where in order for you to achieve God's grace, His promises, His blessing, achieve holiness, achieve uh, a sanctification, achieve you. It's, it's all about how you act. It's all about your behavior, right? And you have to achieve these things. 
you know, if you achieve it, that means it's not a gift, right? Anything that you earn is not a gift because a gift is truly the gift. Amen. And so are you there, John point John six and twenty six? Amen. Alright, so Jesus replied, the truth is you want to be with me because I fed you, not not because you saw the miraculous signs. But you shouldn't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that that I, the Son of Man, can give you. For God the Father has sent me for that very purpose. Now before this you what you will see is they they're trying to figure out, well, how can we do these things that you're doing? Right? And so in verse twenty eight they replied to, to Jesus, here's what they said. What does God want us to do? Now, this is what religion is always, and, and the thing about it is, especially the days in Christ, the days in Christ, they go to a uh, person who's on front saying, well, what, was God, what does God want me to do? And then that's when they swell up. <laughs> well, God wants you to <laughs> fill my bank account with uh, your money and you know, right? I mean, they come up with some things, right? But here, they ask, what does God want us to do? And Jesus told them, this is what God wants you to do. Believe in the one he has sent. That's it. That is it. All that other stuff is ridiculous. All that other stuff is a show, it's an act, it's a game, you know, and, and it's too many, uh, we got too many Broadway stages in the church today. Right? Too many Broadway stages. I'm not talking about from the plays and the dance schemes. I'm talking about from the ministers and deacons and pastors standing up in the pulpits lying to the people and telling them that this is, in order for them to be saved, they have to do all of these things. You know, uh, Deacon Duncan was talking the other day about somebody talking about the, in order for you to have the Holy Ghost, you have to speak in tongues. What kind of tongue foolery is that? Tongues is a gift, and we read over that. We didn't complete it, but we read over it, and tongues is a gift. So if if tongues, if tongues, if you have the Holy Ghost means that, okay, well, you speak in tongues, so you got the Holy Ghost. If that's the case, then that's saying that the gift has given you the Holy Spirit instead of the Holy Spirit giving you the gift. Tongues is just a gift. And it's used not for people to show off. It's used for a purpose. That's why in Acts 2 and 4, it was used so that people could understand and then get saved. Because the disciples, they, they, weren't, they, they weren't like Paul. Paul was first taught. And, I mean, he was like, he'd been to schools like our Yale and our Princeton. Paul was smart, right? However, the other ones... You know, Jesus found him out on the street. What you doing, dude? Hey, I'm fishing here. <laughs> yeah, hey, well, come with me. So he took a fish. You know, he took some of these guys and stuff like that. And and the thing about it was, this is what people are doing today. They're trying to tell you that in order for you to get anything, it's because of your behavior. But just like you're saying. That's impossible to be a gift if you have to do something to earn it. And then, look, you know, over 3,000 people got saved that day. Remember, at the bottom of the map was the Mount Nebo where Moses and the work? 3,000 people died. But that day, when people got the Holy Spirit and started speaking in tongues, listen, they got the Holy Spirit, and then they started speaking in tongues. They didn't speak in tongues first and then get the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works, right? And the Holy Spirit did it for a purpose, so that the people could understand and hear the Word of God in their dialect. And when they heard the Word of God in their dialect, coming from these disciples who did not know any other languages, they, 3,000 people, got saved. Because they was like, how did they know the talk? How did they know how to speak? My lady, how do they know this? It must be a God. Hey Amen. And I love that you was bringing up the Holy Spirit because people, like I said, aren't being taught that when Jesus Jesus told us about the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm leaving you a comforter. And guess what? That comforter is 
your lifeline, your, your power source to where, guess what? You don't need a tabernacle no more. You don't need this and this and that. You have a direct line to the Father. You don't have to have anybody else to go before you to talk to the Father. You have a direct connection to the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. And he will never condemn you. He will never judge you. He is a perfect gentleman. And he always will. And one thing I love about our God is that he always gives you, as we talk about the revelation, he always gives you warning before destruction. The revelation knowledge is the good and the bad. Good. They hear a warning before destruction. They hear that, okay, well, God gave me a warning, and now he's about to destroy me. That's the way they hear it. But that's not the way it's being said. It's saying warning before destruction. Because here's your warning. If you keep going in that direction, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna destroy yourself. You're going you're gonna to hurt someone. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to lose your family. You're going to lose this. It ain't that God is destroying you. You're destroying yourselves. And God is trying to prevent you from doing that by giving you warning. Amen? Amen. 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 As, um, as I'm closing, and you know, part of it, so just remember, this is talking about continuing in God's grace. But it has to be put out in which he's going to keep on doing you. So you have to be taught what God's grace is first in order for you to continue in it. Because you can be continuing in religion. You can be continuing in somebody's opinion, somebody's feelings, instead of continuing in the gift that has been given. Amen. Continuing in the gift. And not know and realizing that it's not based upon your behavior. You don't have to earn it. You can just receive it freely. Amen. 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 Um, let me close with uh <laughs> if you're local, come on out. We're here Sunday. 9.45, 10.45 for Sunday school. 11 o'clock starts Sunday service. Come on out. We're a family here. Bible study is Wednesdays, except for the fifth Wednesday. That's for staying at home, getting your family in order with God, spending time with the Lord outside of these four walls. But the first through the fourth Wednesday, come here. Come on out. It starts at 7.30. It's 8.30. It's only an hour. Sometimes it's not even that long. Well, no, it's going to be that long because our uh, admin, she's going to make sure we start right on time. On <laughs> she's going to get you hey, on time. But, hey, that's, that's how God God operates. He's in an order. Guess what? Hey, we make it fun in here because when it's fun in here and we just be ourselves, that's how you retain it. And that's how you can apply it, live it, and share with others. That's to see how good God is. So, hey, like we say, if you're local, come on out. And always remember, this is a no judgment zone. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. So stay free.